asthma isn't usually triggered by a you know an anaphylactic reaction. So you may have difficulty breathing. So it is bronchoconstriction that you have with asthma, but it's there's no evidence that people who have asthma have increased risk for anaphylaxis to bees. They do have like increased risk to exposure to peanuts and other type of food allergens, but not to honeybees. Um, okay. And the other thing is, is just so that you know, the other thing that um, we have seen is that people who are elderly, so some of the big stories that you've seen related to deaths related to honeybees is that people are trying to take something out, like a hive, and it's an elderly person. Recently, I think it was in Texas, where there were two, like a couple, both in their 90s, who tried to extract a hive on their own which was just, you know, a bad idea. So normally an adult can take between 500 and 1,400 bee stings before um, you could die from that many stings. So you can die if you're stung enough, but that's a lot of stings. Um, and it's very unusual, and we haven't met yet someone who's had that type of, you know, exposure. But we do count a lot of stings when we're doing a bee extraction. The other thing I wanted to just kind of address is the idea that Africanized bees sting people to death. So um, the one thing I wanted to just emphasize is that the honeybees that we have here are European bees and African bees. They're a mixture. There's no large colony of honeybee that's native to North America or South America. So all the bees that we see are imported. We have thousands of native bees that are solitary bees. So there's bumblebees. They form very small colonies, 100 to 200. But these large colonies that we use for pollination and honey production have been important. And if we take a look, Vector Control in LA County has looked at the uh, genetic content of the bees that are in our area, and they're approximately 80% genetics from African bees. And so people work with bees in Africa, you know, just like we, people work in Europe. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting idea that we call them Africanized bees that are going to kill people. You know, they're working with bees here all the time, and they're walking around and barefoot and, you know, in the population, just like more so than we are. Okay? So people, even in Africa, can have several colonies of bees, and these are just um, beehives in the back of her. And they just walk around with, you know, no protection, just like we walk around here, because our bees are very similar to their bees in their genetic makeup. Okay, so we, we do is really look at the behavior of the bees. So some bees are more defensive, and we like to keep bees within the urban population that are less defensive, very hardworking, um, but that aren't going to be a nuisance to us. And then just a few first aid facts. The one thing that you want to do as soon as you've been stung is to remove the stinger. A lot of people will try to pull it out, that actually will squeeze the venom sac. So you want to scrape it out either with the back of a knife or a credit card or even with your fingernail. You can just kind of flick it out. You want to wash the area with some soap and water, nothing special, you know, no beta dye, nothing, no hydrogen peroxide, nothing too crazy. The most um, easily accessible treatment is just ice. You put some ice on it and it'll keep the venom from moving within the skin and then it also helps with the pain, the swelling, and the redness. Uh, and then if it continues to hurt, you can use some just Tylenol or Motrin, just over the counter like you normally would for something like a, a bump or a bruise. And then for the itching, which is the most bothersome part of it, I think, a day or two later, it can really itch like crazy. You can use an antihistamine like Allegra, so it's non-sedating, or uh, Benadryl. If some people just have a little difficulty sleeping if they're so itchy. They've had a few. And some calamine lotion just topically will work. And then some people say meat tenderizer um, and actually baking soda because the toxin is acidic, so a way to neutralize it is to use those two things. You can just rub it in. They say to rub it in for 20 minutes, but I don't know who's going to sit there for 20 <laughs> minutes. You'll probably forget about it by then. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Any thoughts? Who's been stunned by a bee? What do you have been stunned by a bee? Mm -hmm. Never? Well, I'll have to get you like. <laughs> just swat one. Just swat one. Just swat one. Yeah. Um, when you say scrape it off, yeah. um, scraping against the grain or towards? What you're trying to do is really just get between the stinger. So, you know, it's, so it's like either way it's fine. Yeah, there's not like a right way or a wrong way oh. really to do it. So if it doesn't come out one way, try the other way. The quick way. Yeah. The sooner the better. Yeah. Because you can actually see the stinger go. Oh. I know. <laughs>
you. Is, is there any test for someone to find out if they're allergic? So that's a good question. So in terms of allergic testing, there are ways that you can do skin tests that expose you to the proteins that are in the bee sting, and, and allergists can do that. Uh, the interesting part about that is that you can have people who are tested and found to have an allergic reaction. Approximately 40% of the people that are subsequently stung that have tested positive don't even have a reaction. It's not like they don't, they don't even have anaphylaxis, they don't even have a serious reaction at all. So. Um, it's hard to know, you know, what the history is of like people who have severe reactions. But anyone who's had difficulty breathing, who's you know had to go to the emergency room and receive epinephrine as a treatment, I, I would say no matter what, no matter if you have a beekeeper next door or anything, if you live in this world, you're exposed to bees, and people should have desensitization desensitization therapy. I mean, we receive it. Like, I used to have very big reactions, um, you know, that would go all the way up my arm. And after being stunned a few times, they actually got smaller and smaller. And so that's what desensitization therapy is, is like small little exposures, and then your reaction becomes smaller and smaller. I mean, there are some people where they get stunned the first time, and then the second time, and the third time, it gets bigger. And those are people who need to watch out to make sure they're not getting those big tear play reactions, and where they should see an allergist. Um, if if somebody was going to um, have uh, beehives mm -hmm. in their property, mm -hmm. and there's properties on either side, one has elderly people, the other one has small children, and the other one has a pool. Mm -hmm. Any any issues with any of those things? I think that's a good question. I think the one thing is, is there are times where there's more bees. So like if we're, if you're a beekeeper and you're doing an inspection and doing things like harvesting honey, it might be good you don't want someone to be having a party next door when you're taking out a lot of bees. So I think kind of being in touch with people if you're doing a lot of big bee activities where you expect a lot of bees flying around more than usual. And those are things that I, I do try to tell people, you know, just check in with your neighbor and say, I'm going to be doing this activity. There's going to be, you know, more bees than usual. So just to be on the, you know, the lookout for it. But in terms of a usual, like a usual amount of bees, is there any yeah. reason why that would be an issue? No, because they're just flying around like they would from any other hive. So it's only if we're doing something very invasive to the hive. And that doesn't happen very often. Any, any, anything that you have seen that minimizes or that, or that safeguards, you know, how, how can we prevent people from getting stuck? Oh, well, you know, the one thing is, is just educating people so that they know, you know, just in general, because they're not necessarily going to be stung from their neighbor's hive. Because then what usually will happen is bees will leave a backyard and kind of travel up and out. So what they'll do is, less likely go next door, they'll be out and you know, up to a mile away. So um, it's hard to you know keep the bees in one spot, but you can also keep the bees kind of going up by how you position walls around them. Yeah, and there's like a as the springtime comes it gets bigger to this like about a seventy thousand and then some hives actually die out during the winter time because they get so small they can't keep themselves warm. We see sometimes little balls of bees. And then when it warms up again and there's more available nectar and pollen, they'll build up again. So it is this kind of like just um, a natural ebb and flow of the colony size, but it's still one colony. But you want to provide enough space so that they feel like, because they're really set to pack away for the winter time. So they want to pack, 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 and if there's no place to put the honey and the pollen, then that can be very frustrating to them because they're bringing, like, bringing it back and not having a place to put it. So then that's when they'll feel like they're too cramped and they'll need to swarm off. So that's why we give them as much space as possible. And that's why we can take off, say, like, if we put um, another layer on top, we can just take off that honey because they don't really need it. They're just doing what they're kind of genetically embedded to do is to store, store, store. So we give them extra space. They don't see a need to move off, over, and swarm somewhere. They stay put. They keep on packing, and that's why we can take away like sometimes 50 pounds of honey a year. So we do have a list of mentors, and I think we're getting up to the point where we have mentors in many different areas, not only LA County but different counties, so that people have access to people who, you know, have a lot of experience and are willing to kind of just lead people and hold their hand through it. Because 
we want people to feel comfortable. Um, and we have a list that is on Yahoo so that people can post questions. So if they're like, oh, I see this behavior, I'm not sure what's going on, they can post. And usually within, I would say, less than half an hour, they have a response for at least one or two people. So it's a pretty active, you know, involved group so that people are getting feedback like almost instantaneously. 